Hello, Mark. Hello, Michelle. I'm so, so glad that you're here. Thank you so much for joining me today on um, Michelle's Conversations That Matter. I'm thrilled that you're with us. Uh, you come to us live today from LA, California. From Los Angeles, yes. There we go, awesome. So um, for those of you who do not know, I'm doing this mental health series, Michelle's Conversations That Matter, because I would like to elevate the conversation about mental health, create more compassion, more understanding, and maybe even educate or inspire people with different topics, different, um, I'm having different guests from <clears throat> respected um, clinicians uh, like, mark today to individuals who are willing to share their stories so i'm so grateful you said yes so without further ado mark could you please take a moment just to introduce yourself tell us um, who you are and what you do well uh, my name is dr mark goulston uh, i'm an, an author now of nine books and i was a suicide a boots on the ground suicide specialist for about 25 years and none of my patients died by suicide and I've been trying to figure out what I did that caused them to want to live. And I, I have a new book out co-authored with my co-author, Diana Handel, called Why Cope When You Can Heal. And in that book, we talk about something called surgical empathy, which you and I will get into. But um, there's an anecdote I give, and it's a little highfalutin, so I'm not comparing myself to Abraham Lincoln, but it'll tell you a little bit about my life. Uh, there was an anecdote where he was going between towns and he passed the horse that was stuck in a ditch. And after a couple hundred yards, he turned around, took his whole team back to the horse. And someone said to him, why did you do that? And he said, I couldn't get the pain of the horse out of my head. And that's my life is that I can't tune out the pain in the world. I, and I'm not a depressive, but the pain in the world cries out to me and I have to do something about it because I've learned ways to lessen it a little bit. And, uh, and, and again, it doesn't depress me, it saddens me, but I just feel blessed because it feels fairly meaningful to do that. Amazing. So is there a personal backstory as to how you gravitated toward this work um, that we should know about, like a loved one suffering or an experience that really resonated with you? Well, there is a backstory. Uh, one of my greatest accomplishments, uh, personal accomplishments, you know, you know, besides having a longstanding marriage and kids and all that, is I dropped out of medical school twice and finished. And I think I dropped out for untreated depression and because I was highlighting all the books and I couldn't hold on to the information. So I took a leave of absence, took on a blue collar job, which I still romanticize in my mind because it was just so simple, so stress-free. So uh, Howard Rourke from The Fountainhead uh, and came back and then my mind left again. And so I took I asked for another leave of absence and I met with the head of the school. I don't remember that meeting, but he's concerned with money because every time someone leaves, uh, they lose matching funds. And I think he was worried about what I might do. Mm -hmm. uh, and he referred me to the Dean of Students. So to appreciate this, you need to know I came from parents who are, you know, depression age parents. Mm -hmm. And so my mindset was you're only worth what you can do. If you can't do much, you're not worth much. Yeah. So I was at a low point. So imagine if you come from a background of, they were loving, but conditional love. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Yeah. And, and so I go in there and the Dean of Students, and I'm not spiritual. Uh, people will say I am, and, and I'm not religious. But I think I met an angel because he gives me the letter from the other Dean. And it says, I've met with Mr. Goulston. We talked about an alternate career and I'm advising the promotions committee that he be asked to withdraw. So I wasn't failing anything. And I said, what does this mean? And Dean McNary, the Dean of Students looked at me and he said, you've been kicked up. And I felt like it was a gunshot. I, I folded over and I started, I thought my eyes were bleeding and I just kept looking at my hands 
for the blood, and it was tears. And and then imagine hearing this when you feel like you've just hit bottom. And he said, he said, Mark, you didn't screw up, but you are screwed up. But if you get but if you get unscrewed up, I think the school would be glad they gave you a second chance. And so I just he's pummeling me with compassion and empathy. I didn't know what that was. And then and and then this was the winning thing that he said, changed my life. He said, and even if you don't get unscrewed up, even if you don't become a doctor, even if you don't do anything the rest of your life, I would be proud to know you because you have a streak of goodness in you that we don't grade in medical school. We should, but we don't. Mm. And you have no idea how much the world needs that goodness. And you won't know it till you're 35, but you have to make it till you're 35. And I'm just sobbing. I can feel it right behind my eyes now. And he said, and you deserve to be on this planet. And then he went like this, and you're going to let me help you. So he stood up for me to the medical school to defend me. And, wow. and, and I think if he had said, if I can help you, call me, I would have gone back to my apartment and I don't think I'd be here today. Yeah. But, the, but the fact that when you don't think you can do anything, but there's something of value in just who you are, which yeah. you don't recognize, and there's a future for that, and someone sees it, and then they're willing to go to bat for you right. at their own risk. He was a PhD. He took on all these MDs, heads of hospitals, yeah. and, and they gave me that leave of absence. But something just clicked in my head. So for the next 35 years, I just paid it forward. Wow. So that's essentially what I did. I just paid it forward with the people that I would see. I would listen in to them and I would see their goodness and I would see their value and I'd see how alone they were. Yeah. And, when, and when they saw me seeing that, they, uh, they just leaned towards hope. I'll tell you another anecdote, which will give you the chill. But is that, but is that, is that your surgical empathy? Is that That's your yeah. So he did surgical empathy. He went in. Yeah. And, and, and he freed something inside me. Oh, you mean goodness matters when you can't do anything else? So, But there was one episode that just really flipped the switch in me. I, so uh, one of my mentors was a pioneer in the field of suicide prevention, Dr. Ed Schneidman. And if you look him up, he was one of the top three people in the field. And he would see still suicidal patients who had to be discharged from the inpatient wards. They weren't acutely suicidal, but you can't keep them forever. And a number of them, the residents didn't want to see because they were afraid they just killed themselves. So he'd go up to a consultation, refer them to me. And there was one patient that I'll call Nancy. And I was seeing her. She'd made three or four attempts before I saw her. She'd been in the hospital three months every year for about four years. Mm -hmm. And I was seeing her for about six months. And I didn't think I was helping her, except that's the longest she went without, you know, without uh, a suicide attempt. And she never made eye contact. So if you're me and I'm her, she'd be like this. She wasn't catatonic, but she'd be like this. Mm -hmm. And so there was one weekend I was moonlighting at a state hospital. That's when you cover for the other doctors in a psychiatric hospital. And sometimes you don't get to sleep. So I was up 36 hours and it's a Monday and there I am with Nancy and she's like this. And as I'm seated with her, I'm looking at her, suddenly all the color in the room turns to black and white. So I'm looking out in the room and it's black and white. And then I get the chills and I'm cold. And I thought I was having a stroke or a seizure. So I'm a medical doctor. So I start doing a neurologic exam on myself. I'm going like this and I'm going like this and I'm looking like this and I'm tapping my elbows. And she's like this, so it's not rude. And as I was doing it, I, I realized, okay, I'm not having a stroke or a seizure. And then I had this crazy idea that I was looking at the world and feeling what she felt. And I just leaned into it and it got colder and colder. And then there was a point because I was sleep deprived, I blurted something out that normally I wouldn't. And so she's like this. And I said, Nancy, I didn't know it was so bad. And I can't help you kill yourself. But if you do, I will still think well of you. I'll miss you, 
and maybe I'll understand why you had to to get out of the pain. And I thought, I just gave her permission. I'm in a mess. I just gave her permission to do it. And that was the first time she laid eyes on me. And she was like this. And then she looked at me. And I thought she was going to say, thank you for understanding. I'm long overdue. Then I said, what are you thinking? And then she looked right at me and through me. And she said, if you can really understand why I might have to kill myself to get out of the pain, maybe I won't need to. Wow. And then I kept looking in her eyes, like I'm looking into yours. And I said, I'll tell you what we're going to do, because I didn't want to let go of her eyes. This is the first time she made eye contact. And I said, I'm not going to give you any treatments or advice or solutions that you've gotten before that really haven't worked so that you then have to come back and tell me why you didn't do it. So would that be okay? And she looked at me with a look that said, keep talking, I'm intrigued. And, I, and then I looked and I leaned into her and I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to find you wherever you are and I'm going to keep you company there as long as it takes because I don't want you to be alone there. Would that be okay? And she started to cry. So that's a little taste of surgical empathy. I can't even begin to imagine. You must reach people on such a deep level because you're, like you just said, like you're meeting them exactly where they are and you're not judging them. And you're not trying to fix them. You're just, you're just holding their hand in that space. Yeah. And, and something that I will tell your listeners who, there's going to be a lot of listeners who tuned out, you know, yeah, I don't need to talk about mental illness, but for other people and other people uh, who want to know the business applications of listening. And there's a book behind me called Just Listen, which I'm humbled by. It became the top book on listening in the world. It's in 26 languages. And last year I was speaking in Moscow along with a Nobel Prize winner named Daniel Kahneman. He wrote a book called Thinking Fast and Slow. And I was speaking to about a thousand Russians. And there's a, there's a video clip of what I'm about to say. And what I said to them is, I'm going to change everything you know about communication. And I'm actually going to practice this on you, Michelle. So just get excited, get nervous. And what I, what I said to the audience is I said, if I focus on what you're listening to, these are business people, managers, maybe CEOs. If I focus on what you're listening to and I deliver a bunch of bullets, you know, you write down the bullets, you'll try some of them. And if I'm engaging, you'll give me your mind for an hour. And then I put on my NPR voice. And uh, they heard me in Russian, but my tone came across and I said, but if I focus on what you're listening for and you don't tell me what it is and I get it right and I deliver on it, you'll give me everything. And then I said, let me see if this is what you're listening for. If you're managers and CEOs, you're listening for ways to get better, positive, measurable results because that's how you get paid. Is that true? Da. And then I said, you're listening for a way to get those results that's less stressful because the way you're doing it now, you're drinking too much, there's vodka's flowing, you're eating too much, your people, it's a mess, too much stress. So you're listening for a way to get positive results that's less stressful. Is that true? And they go, duh. And, and then I said, and here's the big thing you're listening for. You're listening for me to give you tips that are immediately doable by you that will help you get those results that's less stressful. And you don't have to buy a book because I haven't written this book yet. And you don't have to take a course because I haven't created the course yet. But if I could give you tips that were doable by you to get better results uh, in a way that's less stressful, it will have been worth the more than 500 US dollars and a day of your time to come here. Is that true? And these are Russians, and they went, oh, da, 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 how'd you get that? And so, so because if you can focus on what people are listening for. So here's an example uh, of my 
li- focus on what you're listening for. Uh, so are you game? I'm game. I'm a little nervous, but I'm oh, game. No, no. It, 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 it's going to be fine. I, okay. I don't take, <laughs> I don't take, Michelle, I don't take people out on a limb unless I keep them company there and I get them safely back. <laughs> Okay. So take a deep breath. It's going to be okay. Okay. So, so if I focus on what you're listening to, you know, you have questions, you have boxes to check, you want to, you know, give useful information. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and, 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 uh, and that's very important to you. Yeah. But if I focus on what you're listening for, it's very important to you that you honor the trust and confidence and maybe hope of your listeners. It's a calling for you. And their trust and their confidence and their hope matters to you. It's not about money. And what you're listening for is, can this guest, this Dr. Goulston, give them stuff that they can use today to make their lives better? And given today's topic, Can he give them information where they might be able to save a life? And also you're listening for having someone who has a huge bestseller and they're an expert, but they're awful. They're convoluted. They make no sense. They pontificate. And you're thinking to yourself, oh, we're going live. How do I protect my listeners from them? And so you don't want to disappoint people who have trust, confidence, and looking to you for hope. Is any of that true? Absolutely. Yep. You could feel that, couldn't you? Absolutely. Yep. And so what I'm saying to anybody who's watching or listening, if you can pause and just be curious about what anyone's listening for, they're always listening for something and you don't have to be as you know, empathic, mind readerish as I appear to be. Uh, you can, in a conversation, especially a transactional conversation that's not going too well, you can pause and you can say to them, uh, "Can we pause for a moment? Because I get a sense you're listening for something, and we're not covering it. And and what would help me is." If you can tell me what you're listening for, and here's a filter that would help me uh, make this a good conversation for you. Uh, I want to know what's, I like to tell, I'm going to take the conversation to the ICU. And I want to know what you're listening for that's important, critical, and urgent to you. And you bring that out because if you can get them talk about what's critical and urgent, yeah. That's the problem they most need solved. And if you can get them to talk about something that's urgent, even if you can't solve it, if you're networked with really terrific people, you can say, I don't think I can help you with that. But if you can't get help with that internally, I know someone and I can make an introduction. Love it. I love it. It's amazing. I love your work. It's just so inspiring yet it's practical right like it's really practical Um, so let me ask you did i did i leave you out on the limb no (laughs) no no you were spot on you were spot on what i'm listening for you're absolutely right like you know i mean i have a trust i feel like i've established trust in my in my community um people people are looking for that so yeah you were spot on with that so thank you really awesome Thank you. Let's let's talk about your book. Can we talk about your book? Mm-hmm. So which one, right? So I like the Just Listen one, but then you just released one last week, right? Yeah. So the one I just released is called Why Cope When You Can Heal. And there's a website, whycopewhenyoucanheal.com. And you can click on excerpts. And there's an excerpt about surgical empathy. Mm-hmm. And here's the difference between surgical empathy, clinical empathy, and tactical empathy. A friend of mine named Chris Voss wrote the best negotiation book out there called Never Split the Difference, former FBI uh, negotiator. And he talks about tactical empathy. Here's the tactic if you want to win a deal. Mm -hmm. And I had sort of a strong reaction to that because 
when I use surgical empathy, it's to save a life. Or maybe that's winning a deal when you get someone, you know, I train FBI hostage negotiators. When you get someone to give up their gun and come over to your side, you've maybe saved two lives, yeah. the police officer and, and the person. And so, so tactical emp empathy is to win a deal. Clinical empathy, and this is what I'm trying to teach doctors, the difference between clinical empathy, there's still, there's still a distance between you and the other person. So tell me if you feel the difference between clinical and surgical empathy. Clinical empathy, you know, you come in and you're, you're obviously in a tough state and you say, uh, have you been depressed? Uh, how long have you been depressed for? Uh, have you noticed symptoms in terms of sleeping, eating, you know, feeling negative? Um, have you noticed feelings uh, uh, of maybe wanting to end it all? Have you had suicidal feelings? So those are great. Those are all professional, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. That's clinical empathy. See if this feels different. Uh, you've been depressed recently, haven't you? Mm. Uh, you've been really depressed. You've had moments that you didn't know how you were going to get through it. Maybe even moments like that in the middle of the night. And there was a miracle when the sun rose. And you've had times when you don't know, you know, how much of this you can tolerate. Is any of that true? Mm. Why don't you take me to the last time you felt that? So I'm going to give people listening. Can you feel the difference between that and checking boxes? Totally. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. I don't so, feel like I'm looking. I'm, I don't feel like I'm being looked at under a microscope and analyzed. I feel like you're right with me and you're talking to me and you're, you're, it's like you've been with me and you lived it. Right. So here's three. Uh, I speak a lot to parent groups. In fact, if you look up teen mental health webinar, teen mental health webinar on YouTube, mm -hmm. a friend of mine, he became a friend of mine because two years ago, his 14 year old son uh, died by suicide. And he reached out to me and team mental health webinar. Uh, he shows his nine minute goal cast video that on the goal cast channel got 9 million views. And he talks to about a dozen male founders about it was his fault that his son killed himself. And he, and basically what he was saying is uh, my son I, I made it impossible for my son to really share feeling scared a week because I would rush in with a solution because that's what we do. We're founders. We give solutions. We don't show vulnerability. And he said, and when my, after my son died by suicide, we got this, we found suicide notes. And one of the notes was his password to his computer. And he'd be looking for ways to kill himself for six months. And the other password was tell my story so jason reed created a documentary called tell my story that's on choose and he interviewed people about touched by suicide who had been suicidal but in teen mental health webinar he shares that uh that eight minute gold cast video and then the next 30 minutes he passes it off to me so if you're a parent uh i talk to this is how you get through to your kids. So let, without further ado, because I want us to save some lives. Here's an insight that Jason gave me about kids. When you ask a kid, a teenager, how are you doing? And they say, great, they're usually good. But when you say, how are you doing? And they say, I'm fine. They're not. And know that. And, uh, wow. and, and here are three questions. And when you're talking to a teenager, do not do heart-to-heart -heart talks unless they initiate them. They hate heart-to-heart -heart talks. <laughs> they, hate the, they can't stand them. It makes them crazy. So, But when you're doing an activity together, mm. you know, slide this in, but it'll change the conversation. And, and this is exactly what you say. You could say, you know, we're all hunkered down. You can't go to school and you know, we're all kind of stuck indoors. Here's the first question. 
at its absolute worst, how awful are you capable of feeling? And they're going to say, what? No, I didn't say awful behavior. I said, how awful are you capable of feeling? And they're going to say, they're going to be a little cautious. They're going to say, pretty awful. Here's surgical empathy. You say, pretty awful or very awful? Okay, very awful. Mm -hmm. uh, then you ask them, here's the second question. When you're feeling that awful, sorry for the, uh, yeah, sorry for the siren. Yep. So the second question is when you're feeling very awful, how alone are you capable of feeling? Pretty alone. Pretty alone or all alone? Okay, 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 all alone. And then the third question is, take me to the last time you felt that. What do you mean? Take me to it. Was it 2.30 in the morning? And here's something that happens when he describes to you, okay, it was 2.30 in the morning. I couldn't get to sleep. I was pacing around my room. You know, I hit the pillow with my fist. You know, I looked at the wall. I felt like putting my fist through the wall, maybe my head. And I just couldn't get back to sleep. And I couldn't stop my brain. And I was walking around. And I started searching the house for some of your sleeping pills. And I couldn't find them. And, you know, and I got back to my room. And, you know, and I, I, I was angry. And I wanted to cry. And then, and then the sun rose. And so when you can get them to describe it so clearly that you see it, they refeel it. Mm. But when they refeel it, they're not alone. And then what you say, how often does this happen? Pretty often. Here we go again. Pretty often or too often. Okay, okay, too often. Then you look at your teen and you say, I have a favor to ask you. And even then, they might say, what? When you're feeling that way, you get your mom and my attention in any way possible. You know, you don't have to break something. But you get our attention in any way you can because there's nothing more important to us than helping you not feel so alone there. Do you get me? Wow. So can you see those steps? Totally. Totally. I hope every parent is listening to this. It's powerful. And so what we do in Why Cope When You Can Heal is uh, something we came up with, and I hate the term, but it's in there. We came up with something called the 12 phases emotional algorithm. I hate the term, but the word algorithm, you know, an algorithm are a bunch of steps that when you follow the steps, they're locked together like Lego blocks, you get to a result. That's what makes them an algorithm. Mm -hmm. you know, the techies know that. So imagine you're a healthcare worker or a veteran. Mm -hmm. Uh, or someone who's been through violence. So here's here's the beginning of them, because what we're getting together is a pilot programs of healthcare workers, veterans. We're a little early for the healthcare workers because they're just trying to get through it now for all of us. But see if you can track this in your own mind. You're a healthcare worker, you're usually in the emergency room. Maybe you see one or two deaths a month. You just saw five and one of them was one of your colleagues. So that hits you, and after that hits you, here, here's what we call the trauma, terror, fragile trifecta. Not trauma, excuse me, horror, terror, fragile trifecta. So you're horrified by it. This is like, this is like an awful movie and it's happening. Yeah. You're terrified by it. You feel fragile, but you're duty bound. You're duty bound to help patients just like veterans are. Plus, your fellow healthcare workers, they're doing it for you. Mm -hmm. So what happens is when you get to that thing where you're flirting with panic, after fragile, you want to panic. But what you do is you get a huge adrenaline rush because of the danger. NBA players on adrenaline can play with a broken leg. So the adrenaline comes in, which enables you to push away thoughts, push down feelings, focus and function. And that adrenaline, you can run on adrenaline with all that danger, push away thoughts, push down feelings, and you can deal with that danger. But every time you push down 
push away thoughts and feelings, it's like taking a screaming feral cat and locking it in the cellar. You're not going to deal with it. Right. And then another feral cat, and then 10 more, then 100 more. And then what happens is you make it through. And all you healthcare workers and all you parents, we're going to make it through because we've done it before. So make no mistake about it. We are going to make it through. But what happens is when we make it through, those healthcare workers or veterans, when the danger passes, the adrenaline insulation from your thoughts and feelings goes away. And all those cats in the cellar, you know they're in there. Yeah. Because when you're running on adrenaline, you just did a 48-hour shift and you feel superhuman on the surface, you know something's messed up inside. Yeah. And, and I mean, why else would veterans, when they're not in active duty, come home and say, I can't take it anymore, i got to kill myself? It's right. because every uh, everything they pushed inside needs to come out. It's yeah. just the way our mind is. And so, uh, and so surgical empathy then helps healthcare workers or veterans go through all of those steps one by one mm -hmm. and and then feel the feelings so we have an exercise in the book called the distress relief exercise and we're encouraging people to make a journal out of it so okay. here's something here's something else you can use okay any of you uh and and i use it and i it's is it on my table here no uh so when I made it through medical school, uh, I started keeping a journal, and that was in 1976. And the first journal I wrote down, I can't believe I made it through, they've released the madman. <laughs> and I have 45,000 pages, I'm on volume 253. And I would just write down thoughts, I just write down things. Because even if the world said no, or what does that have to do with anything, or how are you going to monetize that? Yeah. If you thought it, you felt it, it's worth writing down. And so in this distress relief exercise or journal, what I now have is I have a picture of the dean of students in the inside cover. Mm -hmm. And on the opposite page, I imagine he's walking me through the following. So when I get tweaked by something, or I hit mm -hmm. a roadblock. Right. I imagine him, and he died many years ago, I imagine him saying to me, and I see his picture, him saying, uh, you can do this, Mark. And I see his picture. And then he says, okay, what's the day, date, and time? You know, let, let, let's keep a journal. So I write down the date and time. And then I imagine him saying to me, Mark, what just happened? Well, such and such, and I, you know, I don't know how I'm going to deal with it. Mm -hmm. What do you think what happened? You know, I, I have no idea what to do. Mm -hmm. What'd you feel, Mark, when it happened? I feel scared. I feel scared. And now, the next one's the most important thing. Mark, what does it make you want to do? So you express the impulse. Mm -hmm. I, I just feel like quitting. I just feel like running. I feel like getting drunk. Mm -hmm. And then I imagine him saying to me, Mark, take a deep breath. <laughs> What thing to do? Talking with you in my head. Why is that better? That's the last thing. Because yeah. I'm remembering you. I'm remembering you that you believed in me when I didn't. You right. saw a future for me when I didn't. I was blessed to have you in my life. And I miss you. Mm -hmm. And see, when I feel the appreciation, the gratitude, and missing Dean McNary, I'm just filled up with, wow. And, and, and then whatever tweaked me, I'm not even sure where it went. Yeah. But, but can you follow that? So you can create this journal and why, now you can just do a journal without having a mentor. If you've never had a mentor and you're a teenager, put up LeBron James. He can yeah. talk you through it. Yeah. Uh, put up uh, uh, Steph Curry. They can talk you through it. Put up anyone. Yeah. Uh, put up Beyonce. Uh, uh, and why is it important? Because, see, when you feel someone else caring about you, it releases something in your brain called oxytocin. And oxytocin is the bonding hormone. And what people, most people don't know is that oxytocin counteracts something called cortisol. 
So high, when you're under stress, your cortisol goes through the roof mm -hmm. and your cortisol makes your brain jumpy. Mm -hmm. People who know anything about neuroscience have heard the word amygdala. Mm -hmm. So high cortisol starts tickling at your amygdala and it tells your amygdala, let's take all the blood away from the thinking brain and put it into our survival brain and get the heck out of here. Or when the blood goes away from our thinking brain, we either fight, we flight, or we freeze. So a deer in the headlights is literally a deer in which the blood has really just drained even from their mammalian brain into their reptile brain, and they're just staring at you. But mm. when you increase oxytocin, cortisol goes down, the amygdala settles down the blood flow goes back into your upper brain and you can start to think. That's why I like using a mentor who loved me. Yeah. I love it. That's powerful. I love it. So can we switch gears a little bit? You, um, you dedicated the book uh, to healthcare workers and I wonder sort of what your take on how COVID is impacting society. We, before we went live, we were talking about all of the challenges that are emerging because of COVID. People are, are now in the ninth month of it. There's financial challenges. People may have lost their jobs. They're unable to potentially like say goodbye to a loved one that they've lost. So. Um, obviously the healthcare workers I'm worried about, I'm sure you are, as you mentioned, and as you dedicated the book to, but like, what, are, what's your take on the impact that this is having on society and, and sort of any words of hope or wisdom? Well, it's having a huge impact on society. And, uh, and one of the most eloquent things I've ever heard, uh, was someone who had gone through a trauma and, didn't think she could get over it or past it. And she came in one day and she was calm. And I said, what happened? And, and, she's, and it was just eloquent. She said, you know what it comes down to? Living with life never being the same again. Yeah. Living with life. And I said, what does that mean? She said, Life never being the same again doesn't mean it's over. Yeah. You know, doesn't mean I can't laugh. Doesn't mean I can't love. Uh, and I just, and so, and the point is, and it's interesting, I do organizational and town hall meetings, uh, hope to do some more. And you could do this, uh, Michelle, you could do this. And if you're listening in, you can do this in your organization. Mm -hmm. It'll be a life changer. Mm-hmm. What you do is you have people sit at tables and you say, I want you each to share a moment that you never thought you'd get through, but you did. So you frame it that way. Yeah. You never thought you'd get through it, but you did. And it showed you how strong and resilient you are. Plus pick a moment where someone special helped you. And the reason for that is because when you tell the story, and you talk about that person, you're just going to cry with gratitude. Yeah. And then the follow-up from it is find that person or their next of kin and thank them. It will make their day. It will make your day. So, so does that make sense? We've, we, we went through 911. Okay, it was more sudden. Uh, we've been through prolonged, messy divorces. Yeah. We've been through long bouts of cancer. Sadly, we've lived through a depressed child who, who did die by suicide. Mm -hmm. And so we've already done that. What I hope is that people will collectively share the experiences. And, you know, and I'm being tapped to be part of town hall meetings. It looks like we may be doing something with the governor of New Mexico because the incidence of depression and suicide in that state, especially in Native Americans, is huge. So that might happen in the next few weeks, and I'll participate in that. But um, yeah. but, but we, we, we will get through this. Um, and what I'm hoping 
and thank you for having me on, is there's also an opportunity that we can start to have conversations with the people we love yeah. where they and we get to open up. Because yeah. what, what's happened is these intimate, <clears throat> empathic conversations have been lost to excitement. Yeah. Well, I want to, can I, do I have time to share an, uh, another yeah. anecdote? Sure. So uh, this is before COVID. Uh, I was part of a panel at Hollywood High School. Okay. And if you look up Surgical Empathy Hollywood High School in my name, you'll see how I described it. And we were talking uh, with about 40 high schoolers and we were in the cafeteria and it was and, and I could tell they were there for the pizza. And there was four panelists. And whenever I'm on a panel, I always go last because I pick up when there's a disconnect sometimes. And the other panelists were great. They just gave great clinical information. This is what stress is. This is what anxiety is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and the students were able to pay attention for about 15 minutes and I could see they were getting restless. So picture this, it's in the cafeteria, there's 40 students. And I said, I'm gonna try something else. I said, I'm part of a documentary called uh, Stay Alive, an intimate conversation about suicide prevention where I interviewed Kevin Hines. He jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge and survived. And yeah. We talk about that. Yeah. And, and it's won five honorable mentions. And I said, yeah. in, in one of the segments, we talk about something called the seven words. And in Why Cope When You Can Heal, it's now 12 words. And, but what I said to these students, and they're looking at me like, who is this guy? And I said, I'd like you to imagine the worst or most challenging moment you had in the last week. So go back. Can you remember it? Raise your hand one by one. And then they raised their hands. I said, good, I'm glad you're there. Now, while you're there, I'm going to give you a choice of a bunch of words. And each of you is going to say the word that matches the event. Anxious, afraid, frustrated, depressed, angry, overwhelmed, numb, uh, ashamed, lonely, alone. And so picture this. They're seated in front of me. And one by one, you know, they go from the left to the right. Uh, angry, lonely, afraid, mm. ashamed. So each of them is saying the word. And then afterwards, and the room flexed, the room flexed towards each other and me. And I said, how did that feel? They said, that felt great. I said, why did it feel great? They're negative words. And they said, I didn't feel so alone. Yeah. Well, did you judge any of the other kids? No, 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 not at all. And I said, here's the challenge. You're teenagers. You live on four words. And those four words are excitement, boredom, fear, and anger. Mm -hmm. excitement, boredom, fear, and anger. And you just felt something else and you felt better. Right. Write down those words and reach out to your friends and said, you know, there's a meeting at the high school and this crazy psychiatrist tried something. And, and you ask them how they're feeling. And you can say, I want, uh, you know, think of a bad time you've had recently. It's because the problem with giving people rah-rah stuff is the rah-rah, if you pump them up, and you leave, you're the pump and it goes away. And then they go back and they get a terrible text. Yeah. They're, down, they're down in the dumper. So yeah. that's why you have to go where they are. And what was fascinating, Michelle, is the facilitators were behind these kids. And one of them came up to me and they said, it was unbelievable what happened. He said, I watched their backs while you were doing the exercise. And when the, each of them was on the spot, because uh, I just went left to right. Mm -hmm. You know, they tensed up. And then when they said the word, they relaxed their shoulders. Mm -hmm. And he said it was like watching dominoes fall towards you. Wow. That's awesome. And, oh, yeah. And, 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 and that's because they felt less alone. We bathe them in oxytocin rather than adrenaline. They run on adrenaline, excitement, excitement, excitement. Yeah. And, and that oxytocin the shared vulnerability. And then when I do this exercise, which I do in many places, and I did this with them, I say, how many of you feel like you're with a group of very special people? And they all raise their hand. Mm 
they weren't any more special than they were an hour before. Right. What happened is they shared a special moment. Yeah, together. Yep. That's amazing. I love it. Thank you. I love it. I love the work that you do, the difference that you're making, the lives that you are saving. So impressive and so inspiring. Um, what are you up to next? Tell us what you're up to next with this book. And I don't know. I feel like you're probably up to a lot. Okay. So the book is uh, it, it's out. And my main reason for the book is uh, my co-author, is amazing. Her name is Diana Hendel. She's Angela Merkel with empathy. And she was the CEO of Long Beach Memorial Hospital when in 2009, an employee of the month came in and killed his two supervisors and himself. And she led the hospital through that back to stability. And then in 2015, she said the hospital was stable and profitable and they deserved a healthy CEO and I wasn't. Mm. So she said, the hospital's doing fine. And she said, I went out and I realized I had PTSD. I got it treated. And now she consults the organizations uh, and companies about how to lead through trauma. So she's my co-author on Why Cope When You Can Help. And we already have another book that's coming out March 23rd. It's up on Amazon. It's called Trauma to Triumph, A Roadmap for Leading Through Disruption and Thriving on the Other Side. So oh, that's wow. the follow-up. So Why Cope When You Can Heal is about, you know, uh, you know how, how do we fix ourselves individually and, yeah. and get through it that way? And how do you get your teams to do it emotionally? But what Diana says is there's such a thing as, as organizational PTSD. Uh, said, and, and like she said, and what we talk about in trauma to triumph, she said, like, when it first came out, we were all united. You know, we all wore masks when it first came out. You know, there's yeah. a lot of cooperation, like 9-11. Yeah. Said, but then what happens is you get these factions. Yeah. I want to open my restaurant. And you get finger pointing and you get blaming and you get shaming and you get anger and you got to manage that. Yes. So what trauma to triumph is, is about how do you lead through that and how do you turn that mess into an opportunity to grow? So uh, that book is coming out March 23rd. So we're going to be uh, doing these things probably for the next six months, but I am up to a, a number of things. So you can also check out my podcast, my wake up call. Awesome where I interview people about their purpose and calling in life mm. and their and their wake-up calls that led them there. Awesome. It's, not, it's not about selling stuff. And I've had people like Tom Steyer, uh, Larry King, Norman Lear, Esther Wojcicki, uh, uh, Stephen Covey Jr., Ken Blanchard. And we're up to about 155 episodes and 90% say it was the most vulnerable they've ever been in public. And I get eight requests a week to be on the show. Nice. And I say, we're not there selling anything. You know, what's going to happen is uh, I want to find out what matters to you. Yeah. We're going to talk about how you got there. And my listeners are going to fall in love with you and they're going to find out everything you do. But to build on that, here's my final thing is starting in January, I'm having a weekly li LinkedIn live show. And we already have te teaser episodes. If you go to Mark Goulston on LinkedIn. Awesome. And it's called No Strings Attached. And my guests and I, and so far all my podcast guests have said, I want to be on it. And Michelle, you're going to want to be on it. Okay. And no, str no Strings Attached is a show in which my guests and I just give away ideas and tips. And there's no strings attached. You want to turn it into a program, you want to monetize it, you want to take credit for it, you can do anything you want and you owe us nothing. Because my view at my age and other people is, you know, if you worry about, oh, I have an idea, I've got to get an NDA and then I get to, you know, uh, uh, a friend of mine, Marshall Goldsmith, the top executive coach in the world, he has something called knowledge philanthropy. Mm. And what he says is, you know, I got enough money. He says, I like ideas, the hassle of trying to develop them. And he says, uh, uh, I'm going to give away all my ideas to the world and anybody can do anything they want. Nice. You know, they, can, they can pay me. They can not pay me. They can 
you know, steal them. They can take credit for it. So because of my age, that's what I'm going to do. And it's going to be an oasis in the middle of LinkedIn. I love I it. That's why LinkedIn approved it because I love LinkedIn, but let's face it. LinkedIn is very transactional. You have to keep your guard up. It's true. It's so true about that. Listen, we have um, Wendell Fields who's commenting here. Uh, Wendell Fields was in um, the movie with um, Kevin Hines. Um, oh. effect. So he has a question. He wants to know what matters to you. So thanks for being here, Wendell. Thanks for your comments. Uh, and I would love to end with that sort of what matters to you since my series is Michelle's Conversations That Matter. I would love to know what matters to you. You do so much for so many people. You've saved so many lives. We want to know a little bit about what matters to you. Well, when you give people hope who don't have it, actually, uh, I started a global movement. I have a TEDx talk called What Made You Smile Today? Oh, okay. Check and it out. I and I even have a hashtag WMYST uh, on Instagram, but because of COVID, it's not right now. But what matters most to me is how little you can do sometimes to change your life. So when what made you smile today was going, I gave this example. Um, uh, you know, you can email me and I'm just as likely to respond to someone, a homeless person, or someone in India as I am to drop the ball in a Fortune 50 CEO. I mean, at this stage of my life, I, I need to be a little bit more organized, but I'm not going to get there in this lifetime. And uh, so imagine this. I get an email from a rule in India, and he had some issue, and I answered the issue. And then when I answered the issue, I said, a rule. I have another question. And I think we were doing some sort of maybe a, an exchange or chat or something. Of course, he got nervous. I said, Rule, what made you smile today? And he said to me, nobody as important as you has ever typed my name. Cute. And he says, every day I go to my computer and I touch where you type my name and I touch your name. That changed his life. Mm -hmm. That's how little it takes sometimes to change a life. Amazing. Thank you so much for being here. Do you have any other final words of wisdom? You've, you've dropped a lot of, a lot of information. I hope parents hear this. I hope everyone hears this and can understand how they can relate to people. But do you have any other final words of wisdom before I let you go? Uh, 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 here, here's my favorite quote. I collect quotes. I had three that were killer quotes if we had other time, I'd give you those. But this one threw all the other quotes off the table. And I had those other three for 30 years. They're good quotes. But this one threw it off. And a friend of mine named Dr. Shawnee Duperon, and she's the founder of something called Project Forgive. And her quote is, forgiveness means accepting the apology you will never receive. Mm. Forgiveness means accepting the apology you'll never receive. When I heard that, my head fell back. And my father, who's been dead since 1995, uh, one of the things he used to say to my brothers and me is, what do you need it for? If we ever wanted anything, what do you need it for? And of course, you know, it found really, felt really dismissive. But after I heard that quote, I imagine him saying to me, I would love to give you and your brothers not just what you need, but what you want. But I'm always worried about money, and I have a lot of pride. So I always want to make sure that I give you what you need, mm -hmm. because I want to feel as good as the dad next door. Yeah. But he never said that to me. And when I realized that's the apology I never got, yeah. I, ap I apologized to him, and I said, I'm sorry I held a grudge against you mm. and I started to cry. Yeah. Powerful. Thank you. Mm -mm -mm. Thank you. Thank you so much.
I'm getting comments up here that people are thankful. They're, they think that our conversation was powerful. I know it was. I know the difference that this will make for people. And I'm so grateful to have met you on Clubhouse and got to connect with you. And thank you for your time today. Well, I'll end like Jack Nicholson and Helen Hunt in As Good As It Gets, which a lot of your audience won't remember, but you might. There's a famous scene between Jack Nicholson and Helen Hunt. And uh, and he basically says to her, uh, I'm going to give you a compliment because I have a condition and I hate taking medicines, but I'm going to take medicines. And she leans into the screen and she says, how is this a compliment? And I'm going to say to you what he said to Helen Hunt, Michelle, you make me want to be a better man. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. You're amazing. Thank you. Thank you. On that note.